Hey, welcome back to the show. I'm here with CPA extraordinaire, Michael Markowitz. Michael's the founder and CEO of Markowitz Enterprises, LLC. He's got 40 years of CPA experience, a dozen years on a nonprofit board of directors. He supports the arts since his teenage years and invests in the arts as well. Michael, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Travis. How are you doing? Phenomenal, as always. I, nothing more than I love getting on and having great conversations with great people. And I think it's fair to say that I can lump you in with the conversations of great people. That's a, wow. that's an easy bridge to cross right there. Well, thank you. I, I, first of all, that's, I thank you for that lovely compliment. Secondly, uh, I'm honored to be here. And I do appreciate your having me on. And I look forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. And so is my audience. There's so much experience that you've had being a CPA and working with nonprofits, getting their 990s filed and all that stuff. And then you have the added experience of being on the board of directors for a nonprofit and supporting, donating to nonprofits that you care about. So you really have like the Swiss army knife of nonprofit experience, taking care of their back end, being on their board of directors and giving as well. We don't find too many guests that are triple crown winners like that. So if you could... Give us a little bit of your uh, professional background and, and how you got here. Well, as you said, I've been a CPA for about 40 years and have had a wide variety of experience, both in the nonprofit and the for-profit sectors. Um, I, want to, I want to kind of jump right to the nonprofit aspect of what you were uh, asking me about. So the, uh, there's a nonprofit that uh, where I serve on the board and where I also serve as its uh, chief financial officer slash treasurer. And uh, I have a client who, and how this, how this came about is I have a client who actually works for TED. And uh, TED had uh, one of their international conferences in Africa, in Tanzania. And they discovered a young man who had uh, built a windmill from scrap metal that he found in the junkyard. And, you know, through his own ingenuity, a 14 year old kid builds this windmill that generates enough power for, uh, you know, to power one light bulb and a radio in his family's home. Well, he was discovered by somebody else that works for Ted. They brought him from his home country of Malawi to Tanzania to speak before the Ted group. And his TED talk is up on TED. Uh, if you Google it, uh, his name is William Kamkolamba. And, um, you know, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And so my client came back from that conference in Tanzania. And he said, Michael, I want to come and meet with you. And he did. And he said, Michael, I want to start a not for profit. Because I really think there's something here. And what he was discussing with me was setting up a not for profit to support um, rural economic development and education in William's home country of Malawi. And he came up with a name for it. It's called Moving Windmills Project, Inc. It's uh, based here in New York. I helped him get it set up. We brought an attorney in to do all the legal stuff. And, and we've been operating ever since. He asked me to be on the board and be the treasurer. And so that, that organization, Moving Windmills, you know, probably for the first eight to 10 years, you know, it, it kind of plodded along. And now we are doing such amazing, much bigger things, raising a lot more money and spending a lot more money and really having significant impact on one of the poorest countries in the world, certainly in Africa. So it's making a huge difference. And I'm honored and proud to be a part of that. You should be. That sounds pretty amazing. Uh, on a side note, TED, for those of you in the nonprofit world that have these extensive mission statements, TED's mission statement is two words, it's spread ideas. So you don't have to get crazy with your yeah. mission statement. I know people that are like, yeah, it's taking me three or four weeks to memorize our mission statement. I'm like, <laughs> why? Good Lord, why? You can't figure out what you're doing in, in, a, in one sentence? And you're like, no, we really can't. I'm like, okay. Uh, but it is so cool as you found... William, the young boy that had harnessed the wind to create enough energy for a radio and a light bulb, discovered by Ted, came to New York, wanted to start his own nonprofit. And it's just such a fantastic story of what 
we can do when we combine our superpowers in, in the human condition and the human, it's so crazy that how some of the stuff gets put together and how it actually works. It's just a phenomenal story. Well, a, a little more of a background on William himself, William Kamkawamba. You know, the reason that he pursued that is because his father, his father is a farmer and Malawi has significant amount of drought. So actually the second windmill he built was to pump water from an underground well so that his father was no longer dependent on the weather to irrigate his crops. Now, because they were, they, you know, William comes from such a poor family, his family couldn't afford the roughly $80 equivalent, US equivalent of tuition to send him to school. So he decided to go to the local library, which probably had no more than like a dozen books, maybe 20 books. And he found a book, which was a physics book uh, that had diagrams that showed how to build a windmill. It was actually, the book was all in English and William didn't even speak English, but from the diagrams, he figured out how to build a, a windmill. Now you mentioned that you know he came to New York. He didn't initially come to New York. Initially he was still, he, he stayed in Africa. And my client and I were kind of like doing all the background work here in, in, in New York. And um, subsequent to that, you know, he was, you know, we raised enough money initially to send him to a high school in Johannesburg, South Africa to get his high school equivalency and then to London to learn English. And then he applied to university here in New York, not, not in New York, he applied to universities in the United States. He applied to eight of them, got into all eight. And he was accepted and went to Dartmouth College. And he got an engineering degree from Dartmouth. Now, fast forward, he's running like three businesses back in Malawi. From here and there, he lives in North Carolina but he's doing it both from here and from there. And there's actually a book that he co-wrote with a, uh, another author called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And it's a phenomenal book. There's also a children's version and there's also a, um, a, a film on Netflix called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. So catch it if you can. I think it's, it, it's well worth it. And you know it tugs at the heartstrings, but it's really great. You see, that just speaks to the ingenuity that people have. There's no amount of restraints. There's no amount of laws. There's no amount of barriers that we can't overcome as a society to accomplish whatever it is we're trying to do. And, you know, every time I say things like that, I've got people that say like, well, you can't fly. I was like, well, you can't, if you have the right equipment, you know, <laughs> he didn't, he didn't, he didn't generate all the power that he needed for his house or for his farm by, physically turning a crank, he built a contraption that harnessed the wind. And it's so amazing that when I hear people that talk about, you know, the things that happen in the news and politics, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that, that they can bring a lot of heartache, but no matter what they determine, no matter what they come up with, we as, as humans can rise above whatever the conditions happen to be. And that is just really the power of being a human. And it's just so wonderful. Totally agree. Totally agree with you. Yeah. I know, I know a lot about you and your personal story, and I'm not sure how much you're willing to share, but I know that your parents survived the Holocaust, which is just astronomical when you look at the odds of, of how the people are able to do such things and to continue life and perpetuate goodness and hope and light throughout the world. You know, absolutely. I'm happy to share it. You, you know, the yes, both my parents, both from Poland, um, survived the Holocaust. And during the war, they didn't know each other, but they met after the war in a uh, what is called a DP camp, a displaced persons camp, otherwise known as a refugee camp in Austria. Uh, and these these camps were run by the Allies, you know, the Americans, the Brits, the French and the Russians. And um, so they uh, ended up in the same camp and they met there, fell in love, got married there. My sister was born there. 
And then when she was eight months old, they came to the United States and I was born in this country. So, um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. My, um, my mom just passed away in early March and she was 95. And in her wildest dreams and in my wildest dreams, I never thought that she would live that long given all, all, of, all of the horrific, horrific experiences that she'd been through. But she really was the anchor. I mean, my father certainly played his role as well, but she was really the anchor to uh, not only get them here to the United States, but also to build and create a whole new life. That, um, and when I was growing up, you know, when I was a kid, even though they always shared stories about their experiences, it was hard for me to really grasp what those experiences were like because I couldn't even imagine as a child, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of horrors those were. But, you know, they overcame. They built a whole life for themselves here. And it's not to say that they ever forgot anything that ever happened to them and that stayed with them very much so throughout their lives. And, uh, but, you know, they um, imbued that sense of, of uh, can-do spirit, and both my sister and me, both both of us are entrepreneurs. <laughs> you know, <laughs> haven't always been, but we are, have been for a long time. And uh, it was that it's that can-do spirit, that entrepreneurial spirit to just, you know, you, there's nothing you can't do. So, yeah, I, I love that how we can take these stories of tragedy and overcoming and use that as fuel to power and pursue whatever it is that we're wanting to do. You yes. know, you, you have done amazing things over your lifetime. You've done a lot of good and you really like supporting the arts. And there's one in particular that you mentioned before we hit record here. The Tell us a little bit about the Broadway Dreams Foundation. Okay, well, um, first of all, I will tell you how this came into my orbit, if you will. I have a very good friend who is a um, senior partner with Alliance Bernstein, the uh, investment house. And he's on the board of Broadway Dreams. And every year they have this big gala in New York and uh, they invite you know, um, a lot of uh, celebrities, Broadway celebrities, and they also invite a lot of supporters. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and he said, Michael, I'd really love for you to come support this. And, you know, can you buy a table for this number of people? And I didn't even hesitate because when I, when he told me what, and I will tell you in a moment what the organization's about, I said, absolutely. This is something that I'm passionate about, that I love, and I'm happy to support. So now let's talk about Broadway Dreams and what it is. Broadway Dreams uh, is an organization that's based, I believe, in Atlanta. And, um, you know, there are a lot of young people that have dreams of performing on a stage, whether it's on Broadway, off Broadway, or some regional theater, whatever it may be, but they don't have the training. They don't have the voice training, the acting training, the dance training, uh, all of that. And so what this organization does is it raises money for uh, to, to be able to support young people who are interested in pursuing that kind of a, a career and providing them with all of the lessons in acting and dance and, and, and uh, voice so that they are prepared once they decide that you know, they're going to audition for a role that they have, they have some knowledge about and, and talents that they can use to show what it is that they can do. I'm a big, passionate lover of the theater. I go to a lot of theater here in New York, and I also invest in some theater. So, um, you know, both I, I and I love, you know, I do love Broadway musicals, but I also love a lot of non-musical theater. Some of it is so powerful and so wonderful. And, you know, there's nothing like a live performance, in my opinion. You can watch stuff on TV. You can watch a movie. It's all great. I don't want to take away from any of that. But actually to be in the theater, the live theater, and you're in the same room as the people on the stage. And it's just so awesome. There's nothing in the world like it. So I get goosebumps even talking about it now. You know, I love that you love that. Um, for a long time, my wife would try to get me to watch musicals and stuff on TV. 
And I was just like, there's no way. How could they coordinate all this singing and dancing? And just, you know, it's like, it's, it's so, un- like, I believe more sci-fi than I do in musicals. Yeah. And then I had the chance to go see Wicked on Broadway when I, was, I went down to, uh, to New York for the weekend. And the show absolutely blew me away. I didn't think there, I didn't know what to think before going in there. I'd been to some like local plays in a small town, you know, was in high school or whatever as a young adult. And I was like, I don't get it. It wasn't my, I, I, I couldn't get it. And then we went down to, we were in uh, at the Navy War College up in Rhode Island. We took the train down to Manhattan for the weekend. Okay. And we ended up going to Wicked on Broadway. Uh-huh. And if, you, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen this, please check it out. It was, it's absolutely amazing. It talks about really the story of, of the three witches in the wizard of Oz and all about the back end stuff and how they became to be and how she really, they, she became wicked, the wicked witch of the West. Uh, it's just such a phenomenal story, the way they put that together and the way they produced it and showcased it. Like I had never experienced anything like it. So I can understand how you would love live theater uh, and really kind of wish now thinking back, the stuff that I saw as a kid had a little bit more production value and it wasn't yeah. just so cheesy because I couldn't, I couldn't for the life of me, imagine how people could get into it until I saw a Broadway show in person. It absolutely just changed the way I viewed everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And just as, as an aside, I had the very good fortune, uh, during the last Tony awards, which just took place a week or two ago to actually attend the Tony Awards. Very good fortune because, you know, the, a ticket to go to the Tony Awards is a tremendous amount of money and it's one night for a few hours. And I generally think, well, it, it's not worth it, but I got a free ticket and I attended the Tony Awards and it was wild. It was just so great. So, is, it, is it fair to say for those that don't know the Tony Awards is the awards for theater? It is the awards for theater, mostly Broadway, some off Broadway. Uh, so it would be like the Oscars, for what the Oscars are to film or the Grammys are to music, the Tonys are to theater. Gotcha. Yeah, there was a long time that I didn't even know, like I couldn't keep the awards straight. And I was like, you get the Globes and the Oscars and the Oscars <laughs> and Grammys were easy to differ- differentiate, but then you get like the Globes for TV, you get Tonys yeah. for theater and it's like, ah just a world I hadn't, hadn't really been a part of the, uh, sure. the arts in general have really kind of eluded me. Uh, well, any, anyone that has a really tumultuous upbringing, they usually find an escape in one of the arts. Uh, yeah. For me, it was movies, movies. I could lock on my whole world would disappear for 90 minutes to, you know, two and a half hours or whatever the, the running time was like, I could, I could definitely get that, you know, Music couldn't really hold my attention. Uh, TV couldn't hold my attention. The arts where I grew up were essentially non-existent. They weren't non-existent, but it's just, you know, it wasn't a thing. But movies, movies really could grasp me, could hold me the way that they could tell a, a whole story in just, you know, a few minutes, really. Sure. It just absolutely could pull me into that world. I could escape from all the terrible things going on in my life. I could yeah. see myself as the hero or as one of the characters in the movie, I could really get the feeling. It just, it blew me away. And I imagine that's how you feel about theater. Yeah, I do. But, you know, in addition to that, I'm also an amateur musician. I play guitar and sing. And I'm also an amateur artist. So I paint and I draw. And all of those are also an escape for me. That's my personal escape. You know, where I can I can pick the guitar up and, and start playing and, uh, you know, the rest of the world just goes away. It doesn't exist for me. Or yeah. I could spend an entire day painting on a canvas. I forget that I have to eat. And it I, I, I just doesn't dawn on me. Oh, my God, I take a break to have lunch or, or dinner. I just forget all about it because I'm so engrossed in creating that piece. But I also love going to museums and seeing other, you know, obviously the masters and other people's art and and so forth and not just here in new york but all over the world i've traveled extensively and i love to go to museums and see the art that they have there well you actually have a second home in spain right i do i just bought that uh not long ago just closed on it in december and the intent is that we will eventually uh lo- relocate there uh in um perhaps in about a year and a half Oh, that would, uh, that's the dream, right? That's what people can 
live yeah. and, and aspire to. Uh, yeah. As far as your time spent as a CPA, I know you've helped a number of nonprofits take care of their yeah. numbers. What are some things that uh, nonprofits may miss or may not consider when they're taking care of their, their finances and their taxes? Like, what are some things that you were surprised to find out or surprised that your clients didn't know? Well, as you may know, and as many other people may know, uh, and I'm not assuming that you do, but I'm assuming that you may, um, you know, accounting for uh, not-for-profits is very different than it is for a for-profit organization. Um, so for example, you know, there are in any nonprofit, there are a number of categories and subcategories such as uh, program revenues and expenses, administrative revenues and, and expenses. And, and so, and, you know, special allocation uh, project uh, revenues and expenses. And it's critical because I've, I've, I've kind of taken on nonprofits that have existed and been handled by other people before. And I was surprised to see how that wasn't being done properly. Mm -hmm. Because what happens in the books and records also is how it gets transferred over onto the tax return. Because it's got to be reported that way on the tax return. Not-for-profits have to meet very strict requirements by the IRS in order to maintain their nonprofit status. So all of these things have to be buttoned up and have to be handled uh, very carefully in detail. And, you know, there's no way around that. So that's one of the things that, um, you know, that we do for some of our clients where we, not for every not-for-profit, but for a number of them where we actually maintain the books and records as well. Mm -hmm. so that we know that it's done right. So then when we prepare the tax return, we know that it's done right. Also, uh, another thing, I, you know, I, I deal mostly with not-for-profits that are based in New York. And New York, uh, you know, there's a charities bureau, which is part of the Secretary of State's office. And there are requirements for um, filing with the state of New York as well. In New York, it's something called a CHAR 500, C-H-A-R 500. And basically you fill out this form and you attach your 990 to it and you pay a, a fee and you send it to them. Uh, and that's great. But there's another uh, aspect of how things work in New York, which is that when revenues or you know, money's taken in by a not-for-profit reach a certain level, now you're required to have either in, in accounting terms, a compilation, a review, or an audit, okay? And, you know, a, a lot of nonprofits aren't aware of that. And if they're a New York charity, they can get into real trouble if they're not aware of it and don't do it. Because the charities bureau will go back to them and say, hey, where's your accountant's report from the compilation or the review or the audit, depending on the threshold of where they are in, in the money that they've raised. So that's something yeah. that we have to be keenly aware of with our clients as well. Oh, absolutely. I, 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 don't, I generally deal with a lot of people in the, in the startup nonprofit world. And the things that they're, they're, there's so many things they're scared to spend money on. Uh, and two of the areas that I recommend they go all out and spend to get the right person is uh, in the legal, their legal team, their, their, their attorney, and then their, their accountant team. Because just there's so many rules that um, you're not familiar with, right? If you know the rules, like attorneys and accountants do, there's a lot of things you can do that you never knew existed. If you don't know the rules, then you get beat up with it, like by them, right? So when I think of people getting beat up by rules, people that uh, uh, poor people that don't look into things, right? They they end up right. paying a, a poor tax. Oh, I don't have money to change my oil this month and then three months later the engine blows they pay the poor tax of having to get a new engine or a new vehicle because they, they couldn't afford the oil change don't be that person in the nonprofit that is scared to spend money because you don't know what to do with it get a professional like michael here that understands the rules of your state and the irs that can keep you out of trouble and i also understand that there's areas uh where nonprofits can actually incur taxes if they create some kind of revenue generating thing that is not tied to their mission. Have you seen this, Michael? Yeah, it's called the unrelated business tax. Unrelated. So, See, I didn't even know what it was called. See, that's why yeah, I have you so, on today. So, so if a, if a uh, nonprofit organization, 
you know, participates in some kind of activity that generates non-related income, it's called, it's called the unrelated business tax. So they're going to have to pay tax on that portion, just as if that, that revenue uh, that was generated was, it was in a profit organization. Okay, so it, it, things for people to be keenly aware of. Now, I did mention earlier that, you know, most of the not-for-profits I deal with are in New York. I also do deal with some others in other states. So, and, you know, I deal with clients even on the for-profit side all over the country and, in fact, all over the world. So I have clients internationally. But, um, you know, when I, when I took on one of the, my not-for-profits, which is based in North Carolina, another one's based in Florida, we look the rules up and say, well, this is what you need to do in this state. And we find out what you have to do. And I can't tell you that I automatically know everything about everything in every state because I don't. But... I know where to go to find things and I know where to go to ask and look it up myself and so on and so forth. So, you know, obviously they have to uh, comply with the rules and regulations of whatever state that they're in. Oh yeah, absolutely. Fully agree with that. Yeah, I love what you said that you can't possibly know everything, but you know where to find the information. And then if you can't find it, you know who to ask. So many people in this world, doesn't matter what industry they're in, they get caught up in this trap that says they can't ask. And I don't know if it's the fear of looking foolish or whatever it is, but I'm, I've been told one of my superhero qualities is that I'm willing to ask the question, hey, I don't know what this thing is. I don't know what this stands for. Where did I leave my pants? Whatever the question is, I'm willing <laughs> to ask it because I don't think that having a question is the same as being stupid. Well, I think one of the true marks of leadership is to surround yourself with people that know more than you do. Mm. True mark of leadership, surround yourself with people that know more than you do. So you can ask them if there's something you don't know. I, they may not know more than you do about every topic, but they may specialize in a certain area that they're so well-versed in that I know that if I need in, to know more information about that area, I have a go-to. And they may be in my organization, they be, may be outside my organization. But I, I have no qualms about asking because there's no way that anyone uh, doing what I do or in the legal world and probably in a lot of other fields as well can possibly know everything about everything. It's oh, just not course. possible. It's yeah. just way too much information out there. It's like, it's like if someone would say to me, well, tell me about this section of the code. I'll say, well, what section is that? You know, because I can't, the code is so huge. The internal revenue code is so huge. I can't possibly know that much about all of it. So anyway. But you know, the, the, the IRS tax code scares some people and they're like, you got to find all these loopholes and stuff. I was like, I kind of feel like the tax code is you open the page and it says, if you're in this bracket, you owe this much tax. And then every other page behind that is how to avoid paying the full tax price. Yeah. That's kind of how I feel about it. Well, I don't think the, IR, the IR, IRS code is going to tell you how to avoid it. <laughs> That's going to require the, um, you know, the, the consultation with somebody like me, for an example, to say, well, we can help you minimize it or we can help you reduce it or we can help you avoid it legally mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. taking these steps. The IRS is never going to tell you those things. <laughs> i always see those jokes those memes during tax time is like you owe us taxes well how much i don't know you tell me and then if you get it wrong then you're in trouble you know well, there, was, there was another joke from many years ago that i think is still making the rounds that says well you know here's the tax form fill it out how much tax do i owe question is how much did you make i made this much send it in <laughs> you know just send the whole thing in <laughs> Yeah. What do you have left? Yeah. We're going to need exactly that much, please. Yeah, we're going to need that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this has been such a fun conversation, Michael. What uh, words of wisdom or advice would you leave our audience today? I could, could you repeat the question, Travis? Yeah. What words of wisdom or advice would you leave with our audience today? Um, Words of wisdom, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm smart enough for that, <laughs> but um, I would don't say- yourself I, short, Michael. We all know uh, you know things. I, I, I would pick up on something you said earlier, and that is that whether you're in the not-for-profit space or whether you're in the for-profit space or whether you're an individual or whether you're a family or whatever it is that you may be, 
um, make sure that you surround yourself with the right advisors, the people that can find ways to take the most advantage of the law and the laws as they exist to minimize how much you are going to need to pay to the government, whether it be the federal, state, or local, you know, because here in New York, we also have local city tax. You know, there are other cities in the country that do too, but uh, we're, I think we're pretty well known for it. But surround yourself with, you know, a good accountant, a good lawyer, uh, good insurance people, good bankers, good financial advisors, you know, make sure that you have a really great team of advisors that are looking out for your best interest. And when it comes to legal, it, there are two aspects of legal that I refer to often uh, with people. Is one is trust in estate law, and the other is commercial law, because oftentimes people will, in their businesses need a lawyer both to help set up their entity and to make sure it's in compliance and all that. So you need two different kinds of attorneys at a minimum. Okay, and so there may be others. There may be labor law. There may there, there are so many different aspects of the law. And when it comes to accountants and CPAs, you know, we are like I, for example, my part. I have two partners, and my two partners also do audit work. I don't do audit work. It's just not something that I do. Uh, I wouldn't know how to begin, but I do know if someone needs an audit. I have I have people I can go to in my organization, and they can handle that for me. So make sure that you have people that can handle all of the different things that you're going to need. Now, an, an organization of my size is not going to handle huge corporations because we're just not equipped for it. But I think we can handle a lot of small and mid-sized businesses and individuals and not-for-profits. And so my, my, my word of advice is make sure you hire good people. And um, you know, good people also cost money. You know, because nobody's going to do this for you for free. And don't be penny wise and pound foolish because you may not get the right person. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying that to talk myself up. I'm just, <laughs> as, as, even if you don't hire me, hire someone else that is going to be a really great person that, you know, good people cost money. That's absolutely true. Henry Ford's considered one of the greatest American businessmen of all time. He found himself in court unable to answer questions. He was like, why on earth would I need to know that? I have a head mechanic for that. I have a lawyer for that. I have all of these experts that work for me. I don't know how to use a rivet. I've got people for that. I've got the best of the best that know how to do all those things. And I don't need to know how to do that stuff. Figure out what it is that you're good at and hire out the rest, hire out the best people like Michael. Thank you so much for being my guest today, Michael. Where can people find you? Well, they can find me uh, either by email or by phone. My email address is, I don't know if they can, can they see my last name? Uh, if they're watching the video, yeah, if they're listening, they can't. So okay. we'll have to spell so, it out for them. Yeah, it's a long spelling, but I'll spell it anyway. So it's my first initial, my last name. So it's M-M-A-R-K-I-E-W-I-C as in cat, Z as in zebra, at... F is in Frank, E is in Edward, U is in use, E is in Edward, R is in Robert, Orlando. So it's foyerorlando.com. So that's my email address. My cell phone number is 917-838-7070. If you do reach out to me on my cell phone, I would just ask that you text me first to let me know where you get, got me or where you heard about me. Because if I get a phone call on my cell phone and it's not a number I know, or that's not in my phone, I usually don't answer it. Okay, we're gonna strike all that out. Was there a phone ringing on your side? There was, my home phone here was. Okay, yeah. so uh, let's give them a website. Website. Owner, uh, one thing. All right. So, hey, so, Michael, where can people find you? All right, my website is www.michaelmarkowitz.net. Michael Markowitz is M-I-C-H-A-E-L-M-A-R-K-I-E-W-I-C as in cat, Z as in zebra, dot net. That's right. Check out michaelmarkowitz.net. We'll have the spelling for you in the hot link in the show notes. Thanks again, Michael. Thank you, Travis, and thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it.